I think we have to talk about the thing that's on everyone's minds and the elephant in the room, even though personally, I think the three of us maybe don't um, put as much weight on this particular thing as maybe people in the mainstream do. And of course, I'm talking about the exchange rate of Bitcoin or the price of Bitcoin. Um, and it's up quite a bit. <laughs> my Bitcoin Paranoid app on my phone has been buzzing nonstop every 15 seconds with a new uh, new all-time highs. Uh, Bitcoin surpassed its previous all-time high of 266. That's the Mt. Gox price, of course, um, on November 5th. And uh, not only did Mt. Gox price, which is the highest exchange rate, pass, pass the previous high, but also the other exchanges too are well over um, 266 currently as we're recording this. I think this is important for at least a few reasons. I mean, price at least has some relation to who's taking an interest in Bitcoin, who's taking a position in Bitcoin. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about interest in China recently. There was a Canadian Bitcoin ATM or Bitcoin vending machine that came out that did $100,000 worth of transactions in its first couple days, uh, or over $100,000 worth of transactions in its first couple days. People are really starting to notice Bitcoin and the trading volume is high too, you know, uh, so it, it's not, it doesn't appear to be that, you know, the price is going up, but there's really not the volume to support it. It seems like a lot of people are trading Bitcoin. Another thing I forgot to add too is when Bitcoin goes nuts, altcoins also go nuts. And so <laughs> altcoins are also on the move upwards as we are recording this show right now. Do you guys think this can last? I mean, it seems like a fast increase. You think it's going to crash? Do you think this price is maybe biased? Do you think it's inflated? I, I hesitate to even say those terms because as we've said before, every price is a real price. But what, what do you think about the Bitcoin exchange rate right now? You know, Stephanie, I just wanted to say that actually I do care about the price. I didn't think I cared about the price, but now I do <laughs> care about the price because it turns out since I denominate a lot of the rates that we pay um, contractors in Bitcoin, it means that my prices have gone down. Mm. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's we're, we're, we're kind of watching a deflationary currency in action. But literally this morning, I had uh, one of the contractors I reach out to offer to cut his price in half because of the increase in, uh, in, in, in Bitcoin's value over time. So from my perspective, it's, you know, nothing but a win, whether it's sustainable or not, you know, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, I have become of the Seinfeld school of thought about the Bitcoin price recently, which is that whatever I think about it, probably I represent the fringiest of the fringe on the believer side. And I, I'm, I'm <laughs> able to step back, I like to think, and try to make rational decisions. But it's that making of rational decisions that is the fundamental problem. So now I've gone with whatever I believe, I just assume the complete opposite at this point. So no, I think this is not sustainable. <laughs> so you want to believe that it is sustainable, but you're assuming the opposite and taking a skeptical position? Ah, uh, yeah, we can go with that. Really, I just don't know what to think. And every time I yeah. try to make any sort of decisions based on what I think, based on you know, like as far as what the market is going to do, I'm just wrong. And even when I'm wrong and I try to counter and get ahead of that and be like, okay, well, that's what I think. So that's going to be wrong. Then I'm still wrong. So I've just completely stopped playing. I just do stuff now. Listen, in order to find uh, the definitive answer to what exactly is happening, all we need to do is use uh, the analytic tools we have for characterizing a uh, asset class that is a cryptocurrency, a bond, a stock, an IPO, a commodity, <laughs> operates on a global uh, network and is traded 24-7 uh, in a distributed exchange that spans the globe. Now, I don't actually have any analytical tools that speak to that, um, because we've never seen an asset class like this before. We can't say it's a bubble, because bubbles have only ever applied previously to stocks and commodities. This isn't a stock or a commodity. Uh, it's a bit of both and a currency as well, so we don't know about that. It kind of behaves like a bond. There might be a bubble there, but we don't know about that either. So. Analytically, we don't have the tools. I think we should develop the tools to start talking about these cryptocurrency asset classes more intelligently, to understand things like uh, not just exchange liquidity, which is the front end, the on-ramp, if you like, into this economy, but the depth of the actual economy, both in terms of users, in terms of nodes that are mining, uh, as well as the monetary supply, M0 uh, measure, M1 measure, and M2 measure now. Uh, here's the thing, we don't have the tools to do this analysis, but I'm focusing on a couple of the underlying drivers. First of all, the run-up from 100 to 200 was very slow by Bitcoin standards and steady. 
it wasn't one of those, um, you know, in 24 hours, uh, huge spike and then dumped. It was just a kind of a, a uphill climb over a couple of weeks. This latest spike has surprised me. I go to bed, I wake up in the morning, I'm richer. Um, I Every day I wake up, I'm expecting to see Bitcoin at 20. Uh, and <laughs> I am ready to buy because I don't look at this price uh, as a short-term thing. I'm really interested in only the long-term of Bitcoin. But here's what keeps me hopeful. This is the most important thing that happened in Bitcoin over the last year. As of this week, uh, BTC China represents almost half the volume in Bitcoin sales. That has never happened before. As of this week, the three other exchanges that weren't Mt. Gox actually erased the price difference, the bid ask spread and the spread between exchanges that was immune to arbitrage before. And uh, some point yesterday, for the first time ever, Bitstamp price overtook Mt. Gox, and then Coinbase price overtook Mt. Gox. That has some very serious implications because it means you can now transfer Bitcoin to those services and take it out without making a loss. So it, it opens some of the barriers to Bitcoin with uh, U.S. dollar withdrawals from Mt. Gox. The geography has shifted. Uh, right now, the center of gravity of Bitcoin is in Southeast Asia, somewhere between China and India. That is the important news, because that wave is deep, it's big, and it happened. So that, I think, is a really important point. We've actually been meaning to get to this China topic for a while, and I've been talking to some people who are active in the space, and I actually have some have some thoughts that I, I want to get your, your opinion on. Um, so one thing... BTC China. Okay, so so China is not your average country when it comes to how you can use and acquire and th their currency, right? The yuan is very tightly controlled outside of the uh, outside of mainland China, and so what BTC China is doing actually is letting people buy Bitcoin with yuan. In the U.S., we have this same sort of thing. You you buy. Uh, dollar, you buy Bitcoin with dollars, but the other side of it is that the U.S. dollar is an internationally traded forex currency, whereas the Chinese yuan is not. The Chinese yuan is is very tightly controlled, and if you need to buy, like if if you have a business and need to buy supplies or something like that from another country, then you can get U.S. dollars from the government uh, or from a licensed exchange. But ultimately, it's very tightly controlled for those reasons. So BTC China is essentially allowing people to take yuan that should only be able to be yuan and. Turn Turn them into Bitcoin, and once they're Bitcoin, then they can go anywhere in the world and do anything they want, and it's completely outside of the Chinese government's control, which seems to be important to them. So, I mean, is that sustainable? That's enormously sustainable. The emerging middle class and the urban middle class in China is both very large and extremely deep in funds, and they have a savings rate that exceeds 50%, so they have a lot of spare cash. Uh, around and they have currency controls that are restricting them from using that cash and they have fear of government control If you add all of that the incentives are there for a very deep very long wave of Chinese adoption The only question is can they do it without the government cracking down and we've had the answer to that for the last several months there have been a number of documentaries on Chinese TV uh, essentially explaining and promoting Bitcoin. Those documentaries did not get on Chinese TV by accident. They did not get on Chinese TV despite the censors. They got there with endorsement and approval from the highest levels of the Chinese Communist Party government. So is this a poke in the eye then to the U.S.? I mean, like absolutely, absolutely. The Chinese get this. They understand the basic equation, which is we would rather have a world reserve currency that no one controls than one that. That our biggest trading competitor and enemy potentially controls. So for China, this is a very, very straightforward strategic move. The world reserve currency and petrodollar is a strategic disadvantage for them. They'd rather have a neutral player. And what they see is that they still have control of the, over their population more so than the US has control over its population. So they f see that any downside that Bitcoin might create through lack of control will be felt more in the US than it does in China. At least that's their calculation. Uh, and I think this wave is extremely significant because it is fully endorsed by the government, it is promoted by the government, and it has a humongous uh, emerging middle class behind it. So if you look at it from that perspective, $300 Bitcoin uh, actually has a pretty solid base uh, from the perspective 
that this is not caused by sentiment. This is caused by expansion of 50% of the market of Bitcoin into a completely new and untapped market, which is China. And of course, we've got 180 countries to follow. Um, and you know, the one to watch next is, is India or possibly one of the Latin American countries. Uh, but but this is the first non-Western adoption, and what it's done is it's shifted the center of gravity of the Bitcoin universe firmly into the middle of Asia, uh, which is where the center of gravity of humanity is. If you want to see the future of Bitcoin, the future of Bitcoin is a 20-year-old, 28-year-old male Han Chinese person, just like the average human face. And so Bitcoin is firmly out of the hands of the Western geeky fad chasers like us. And it is now firmly in the hands of the emerging economies of the other six and a half billion. And that's the best news we've had so far. So ultimately, do we, I mean, whether or not the price is sustainable, I don't necessarily know that it matters, but you know, do we want to make end of the year predictions or anything like that at this point, just for the fun of it? Oh gosh, predictions. People are going to hold and hold us to them. I have a prediction in the long run, in the next five years, Bitcoins are going to go up. <laughs> How Very about good. that? Excellent. Very vague. <laughs> I have a prediction. 99.8% uh, of all financial analyst predictions expressed on Bitcoin will be wrong within three months. <laughs> and that prediction is recursive. That's why you got to go really vague like I did, Andreas. Very just Nostradamus. Think well, I, Nostradamus. Did allow, I did allow for 2%, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> to be Some correct. Some room in there. Excellent job. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I think it's going to hold. I, I really just don't know. I'm going to go with that. My prediction is I still in three months will not know what the price is going to do. Yeah. Listen, I would not be surprised if tomorrow morning I wake up and Bitcoin is at 20. I would not be surprised in the slightest. It would not upset me. I would see that as a natural part of our seesaw boom bust cycle that we've been going through. What I do know is that the new... A uh, consensus price is much higher, and what I do know is that people are now comfortable with three-digit price Bitcoin and U.S. dollars, and that changes the game because in a logarithmic currency, the next step is four digits. I guess, kind of, to bring this discussion full circle, um, we started out by mentioning the Bitcoin machine in Canada that did uh, a huge volume of sales just in the first week that it was in operation. And, you know, we're talking about Bitcoin adoption in China and all around the rest of the world. It's really a great excuse to get out of this. For those of us who are in the US, it's a great excuse to get out of this US centric frame of mind and realize that the world does not revolve around us. You know, there's a, there's a whole planet out there and there's 7 billion people and they, a lot of them are going to be finding out about Bitcoin very soon. Yes, we are now very much and truly a world currency. And I think that was a very important milestone. I'm beginning to see all of the facts on the ground supporting the fact that we are well and truly a world currency. We've got new ATMs in Canada, eh? We've got uh, new buyers in China. We've got conferences all around the world happening with great interest, especially in countries that are currently facing currency crises. Over the next uh, month or so, I'm going to be traveling almost continuously internationally, uh, first going to Athens, Greece, in order to speak at a conference there on disruptive technologies and economics. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's going to be attended by members of the government of Greece. Um, following that, uh, Milan, where we've got uh, the hackathon launch of Dark Wallet, after that Buenos Aires, and then finally Las Vegas back here in the US. Um, I, the international scene is heating up, and uh, I very much hope to spend most of next year uh, with my butt on a plane seat and flying around uh, visiting Bitcoin communities around the world, because it's absolutely not about us. It's about the other six and a half billion, including our new friends from Canada. Yes, yeah, speaking of uh, Canada, there's also a new service launching in Canada where they've got a Bitcoin uh, debit to debit credit card, something like that. It's some kind of card that you can load Bitcoins onto and pay for stuff, which, wow, <laughs> the U.S. is really going to be left behind, especially with all this um, regulatory fervor, shall we say, and uncertainty. And uh, I think that's unfortunate, but hey, we can always uh, we can always move our feet, right? We can yeah. always leave if we really don't like it that much. Hey, you know, was... we don't want no stinking innovation in this country. We like collecting fees for doing nothing. 
you know, I was talking with somebody about uh, debit cards to do Bitcoin recently, and actually, they're much easier to to actually manufacture and have made than I thought. So I I, I anticipate us seeing a lot of these over the next couple of years because really the, problem, the barrier to entry is very low. It's just the regulatory, yeah. Yeah, just exactly. The, regulatory. <laughs> the, the problem is all in the regulatory. I mean, yes. people were talking. I remember BitInstant was talking about having a Bitcoin debit card two years ago, and they just got hold held up by the regulatory stuff. There was no problem with the technology. Even in the prepaid uh, market here in the U.S., the requirements for doing uh, uh, KYC, know your customer, and collecting identification are so onerous. And you can see the difference in regulation. Stephanie, you mentioned that one of the, the Canadian ATM has three identity features, but two of those are turned off. I did. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> the, well, t two, two out of the three identity mechanisms are turned off, and that's not technology. That's all regulation. So already we're seeing... Uh, this competitive arms race playing out not in the technology field, but in who can stomach uh, the risk of a new currency without trying to regulate it out of existence. And the answer so far seems to be the U.S. cannot. Yeah. So, you know, actually, I have a perspective on that because we're actually trying to trying to figure out how onerous it is to actually get some of these in. I'd like to put some of the uh, Robocoin ATMs into a couple locations in California where we are, albeit that's, you know, I mean, this is, of course, an impossible task. Another one I've decided to, to try and take on for myself. Um, but I've been looking into these machines and yeah, they have a number of security features. But the one in Canada, because of the compliance situation, only uses the palm scanner, right? So it scans the vein in your palm to make sure that like you're the same person. And that again is so that they don't have limits, right? Because you're only allowed to sell a certain number in a day. So they don't have to... They can put limits per person instead of limits overall for the purchases, right? Yeah. So they can put per person limits just by using the palm vein scanner. But in the US, what we'll have to do is also have a separate government ID that'll be held up to a, to essentially a camera where the picture will be taken. And then your picture as y the person using it will also be taken and compared to the picture on your ID. So that those are the other two steps that they haven't had to turn on in, uh, in the Canadian situation. Um, one of the interesting questions that I have is how long is it going to take for these machines to pay for themselves? Because as ATMs go, the Robocoin kiosks are quite expensive. ATMs range anywhere from like $2,500 to $15 thousand for really advanced ones and the robo coins are twenty thousand dollars if they if they did a hundred thousand in just a few days um yeah that's that's quite impressive though I can know you that. set your own fee on a robo coin you can but they have standards the standard fees are two percent for buying uh and five percent for selling okay uh, so they've already so they've already made 5k yeah, no, I mean, it's, K? this is I, I just I just did the math and it literally is a 90 day turnaround based on these initial numbers, which I have to imagine wow. will get more, not less. Right. I mean, like if Bitcoin stops being mm -hmm. popular, then they'll have to, uh, the, you know, then they're tying their fate to that. But ultimately, you know, as a new thing, I guess it got media attention. I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see how this shakes out. But I'm super curious to see how long it takes to pay it back because you literally have to have a million dollars go through one of these machines at the default prices before you're seeing any sort of profit. The hardest thing will be keeping it stopped and complying with all the regulatory stuff. Yeah, there's no stocking. I mean, these machines, again, that's another interesting part is they essentially connect directly in. They're not like the Lamasu. The Lamasu machines, you load them up with Bitcoin and then they can dispense whatever Bitcoins they have. But mm -hmm. ultimately, once you run out of Bitcoins, you got to go, you got to put more in. Now, although I guess you could do that remotely. But with the RoboCoin, it's literally making market transactions on Bitstamp for you. But what if Bit Bitstamp goes down? They have alternatives. I mean, like mm. they have a couple others uh, that are available. That was the one that, again, it's shipping preloaded with. Mm. And so, in, in fact, then the regulatory climate is probably the predominant factor in whether you break even, whether you get a return on investment on these devices, which is why such a thing will be extremely successful in Canada and will be extremely successful in other countries that are not taking a... Um, an approach to Bitcoin that uh, that is similar to that they take to syphilis. We're going to see it in, in emerging economies much more successful than in the US. Because right now, just the other day, the Senate uh, decided to call for hearings on Bitcoin to examine the risk that it poses to the economy. They're already framing it as a risk before they even had the hearings. It's the, the only part of the economy that's actually doing good. <laughs> right. And it is the greatest invention of the 21st century in computer science, probably the most important economic advancement in the last 50 years uh, in terms of digital money. But let's talk about it purely in terms of risk. 
That's so short-sighted. It's like talking about the internet in 1994 and worrying that it's going to allow people to see R-rated movies that aren't supposed to see R-rated movies. Satoshi Nakamoto for a Nobel Prize in Economics. But I would say first, the MacArthur Genius Award um, for, uh, for mathematics, computer science. <laughs> mm, yes. You know, because in terms of computer science, distributed time-stamped consensus through proof of work is the invention of the 21st century, without a doubt. And we all know the Peace Prize doesn't mean anything anymore anyway. This reaction from the Senate actually looks a whole lot like the reaction from PayPal to me, right? <laughs> like they're they're interested in it. They're they're they need to check it out, and maybe they'll have a positive thing to say about it. But I think that if we look at their motivations behind it and what they stand to lose, chances are pretty good we're not. They're just gonna faff about and make up some more reasons to protect the banks from any type of innovation. I have very little uh, hope or faith that this will produce anything meaningful other than more knee-jerk regulation. And it, quite honestly, it's entirely irrelevant. It's entirely irrelevant because this is not about payment networks and this is not about moving currency around. This is about reinventing money. And so far, they're not seeing that. You know the other thing else that they're not seeing? They're not seeing that they're proving the point for why Satoshi left and why Satoshi is someone who can never come back and someone who can never make his identity known whatsoever because it's just inviting this. It's inviting ad hominem right away. Yes, absolutely. If you can't attack the idea, you attack the person who created the idea. And right now they're having trouble attacking either. So uh, so yeah, it's, uh, Satoshi disappearing was probably the best thing that ever happened to Bitcoin. There was another very interesting uh, um, parallel, which was a presentation from Western Union where they said that uh, uh, Bitcoin is not ready for mainstream. And I think that was a very astute and correct analysis because when Bitcoin is ready for mainstream, uh, it will be very obvious because then the question will be Western who? Western Union is going to be the blockbuster of this generation of disruption they will be disrupted out of business simply because unless they co-opt and use Bitcoin, their very reason of existence, which is the transfer of sums of money internationally, is completely solved by an algorithm. They've been replaced by a script, and that script costs a lot less to operate than Western Union. So, I mean, just like Blockbuster, you know, I, I went someplace recently and I actually saw a Blockbuster because they sold off all the stores at a fraction of the, you know, the, the asset value. Uh, and in some niches, actually, they have survived. So maybe that's the future for Western Union and these other oh. types of money transfer things. It's just areas where, for whatever reason, Bitcoin simply cannot reach. You know, I mean, maybe like Western Union literally goes back to, you know, horses in places where there simply are no roads and are no phone lines. Quite honestly, I'd like to see Western Union as the place where you find the robocoin ATMs. DNS is the Swiss army knife for your domain names, helping meet their customers' individual needs since 1998. EasyDNS has been an outspoken critic of SOPA and CISPA. EasyDNS was an early supporter of Bitcoin, and now they are proud to sponsor this show. Do business with a company that shares your values. Get a 13% discount when you pay with Bitcoin. Go to bitcoin.easydns.com and be sure to use discount code LTB.